well, um, in addition to the closed captions, the Q&A and the chat, we are also recording this. Um, you know, it's just us here, but uh, the um, chats are, are um, recorded as well. So just giving everyone a heads up. Um, so my name is Frederick Jenka. I'm the executive director of the Carolyn Glass of Bailey Foundation in Ojai. Um, I have with me today, Jana Ireland, who's our current um, exhibiting artist at the Ojai Institute. Um, her installation, Looking In, Looking Out is uh, on view through April 3rd. And um, pretty much most of it can be seen uh, 24 seven um, anytime, any day of the week. Um, until then, uh, there are um, images on the exterior of the building and then also the interior installation can be viewed from the front window. So those of you who haven't had the opportunity to see it yet, I definitely um, encourage you to, um, to check it out. Um, we also are pleased to have um, Frank Escher and Robbie Gunavardena here um, to, uh, to really lead us on our adventure today. <laughs> and um, uh, I'll let everyone know that um, John and I are really sort of functioning as, as co-hosts today. So, um, uh, you know, I, I, uh, sorry, I have an elderly dog growling at me. I'll be right back one second. Hi, everyone in the audience. Thank you so much for coming. I'm really excited to talk to Frank and Ravi today. Sorry, but thanks for taking that, Jana. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, uh, so just to give everyone a heads up again, I see a few more people have come in. Um, Frank and Ravi are going to be leading the conversation with a visual presentation, and then we will um, segue into a conversation and then um, there'll be time towards the end for some Q and A. So, um, you know, feel free to drop those in um, as we go, but then we'll be taking um, some time at the end to review those. So I believe our, our visual presentation is gonna be about 15 to 20 minutes, and then there'll probably be another, um, you know, 15 minutes or 20 minutes or so of uh, uh, conversation after that, and then we'll, we'll break for some, um, some questions. So um, I see a bunch of people have just come in again. Um, welcome. Just a reminder before we get started, there are live closed captions. Um, you can turn those on at the bottom of your screen if you don't have them on already. This is being recorded and um, we have the chat and Q&A functions available. So welcome. So without further ado, I guess let's, um, uh, Frank and Ravi, do you wanna um, get your, uh, get our presentation going? Sure, yeah. sure. I, I don't know if you guys wanna say a few words before we, before we jump into this. Well, uh, you know, first of all, I think we want to thank you, Freddie and you, Jana, especially uh, for uh, inviting us to uh, uh, be part of the programming around this exhibition. We're really looking forward to coming up to Ojai and, uh, and uh, seeing that we've, uh, of course, we've seen other exhibitions of uh, Janice's work and our huge, uh, um, you know, admirers. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, as, uh, and welcome to everyone who is, who is uh, watching. It's a little bit odd not seeing anyone, but, uh, uh, we hope everyone is well. Um, we will speak about three uh, recent and or current uh, restoration projects. And uh, I will speak more about the um, architecture and restoration work and Ravi will speak more about, about the history. Uh, 1952, when this house was built, Paul Williams was already a very well established architect. He had built hundreds of projects of different uh, scale and types. Uh, the year before this, he had started to work with four other architects on the Los Angeles County Courthouse, uh, which is downtown. Uh, but he had not yet done houses for Lucille Ball and Frank Sinatra, that a lot of people know. Uh, these come sort of in the mid 50s, late 50s. He was at the time 58 years old and his three children were young adults who were in the 20s. So this is essentially a house for an upper middle class middle-aged couple. 
The house also reflects William's well-known ability to masterfully combine elements of different architectural styles. Here we have various historicist details in what is otherwise a streamlined modern house. I want to point in particular to the elegantly curved wall and the ribbon window above. So if you look at the floor plan, you enter here and then to uh, at the center is an entry hall. To the right is what is called the lanai. Uh, this is that curved wall that you saw. A sofa is attached to it. This wall screens it off from the street. The view is out to the garden. From the entrance, you would walk into the formal living room. There's a fireplace here, view to the garden, or you enter the formal uh, dining room. And from here, you connect via a breakfast room to the kitchen, to a large laundry area, the service port, and to what was the housekeeper's quarters. On the upper floor, you have the stairs here. You have what used to be uh, Paul Williams' study, which we are converting into a library. There is a very generous guest suite. The two of these uh, open to a large terrace. Uh, there's a master bedroom that also opens to a terrace and a rather splendid and very large dressing area which connects to what used to be a rather modest master bathroom. Now, at a later point onto this terrace, a small addition was built that contained a private hair salon. We are converting this into a new master bathroom. And that is actually the only change that we are doing to the floor plan. Our client bought the house a few years ago from the Williams family. The house had been very well looked after and was overall in fairly good condition. It had aged in the same way as any 70 year old house would age. Our approach here is to carefully restore the house, updates to the electrical, plumbing and mechanical systems, restorations and repairs of windows and to compromised structural elements. And here in the lanai, uh, we are reupholstering the sofa. The next image is of the uh, entry Hall. It's slow to move somehow. And uh, the entry hall and from there uh, uh, into the uh, formal uh, living room. Uh, here we have uh, some of the most uh, challenging issues. Uh, the ground at the, uh, underneath the house settled by about uh, two feet in those 70 years, which caused uh, uh, serious uh, damage to the foundation that we essentially have to uh, uh, replace. In the uh, kitchen, uh, the floor, which is not original, will be replaced while all of the kitchen cabinetry is, uh, 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 will be restored and will be retained. All of this work is being done uh, quite beautifully by Bonomo Construction and is scheduled to be completed this summer. Now, at the other end of the socioeconomic spectrum, uh, we have the pilot house. This was the model for the Mutual Housing Association, also known as uh, Crestwood Hills and the hills above Brentwood, west of the Getty built by A. Quincy Jones and Whitney Smith with structural engineer Edgardo Contini. At, uh, at the beginning of the project, architects Douglas Honnold and John Lautner were briefly also part of the team. This model house, however, was built in Mount Washington to be more centrally located where prospective buyers could see if they wanted to move out to Brentwood. You drive up the hill and you park underneath the house. The house is sort of lofted off the ground. You cross underneath the house to a stair that goes up one level to a garden, and then you enter the house from the back. On the left side, you have bedrooms, more or less in the center, you have a kitchen, and on the right, you would have living and dining rooms. So uh, you would have entered or crossed underneath the house, and then you enter from this site, this is what the house looked like when it was first built, an image from the sales brochure and the way it is furnished. 
but this is what the house looked like when our client bought it. Uh, a lot of changes have been done uh, uh, to the house. Uh, surfaces were painted, built-in furniture and elements have been either altered or removed altogether. Metal sliding doors have been installed. There were entire walls of glass blocks that were installed here on the outside uh, that were adding uh, 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 a lot of weight to the bridge. There were structural uh, elements that were severely compromised. We first started to very carefully strip the paint from the house and uncovered under the layers of paint this very, very beautiful wooden house. The house, uh, all of the non-bearing walls are essentially plywood. The structure of the house uh, and you, uh, uh, you have to imagine there's a beam here and this post sits on that uh, beam and then carries the roof beam that then are attached to this double slanted beam. That is essentially the structure of the house and these frames then carry the roof, the floor and parts of the wall that are all built out of two by sixes. So that's actually the, the structure of uh, uh, the whole house. Um, we did a lot of uh, uh, structural uh, repair to the house, had to uh, update all of the electrical, plumbing, heating systems. You can see here the air conditioning that was installed. Um, and uh, all of this work was uh, very beautifully executed by uh, the contractor, Debbie Ross. Later, the house was furnished by Oliver Firth. It was recently published in uh, architectural digest. So then the last house that we want to talk about is very similar in uh, scale. It is uh, on the edge of Silver Lake, which you can see through here. And it is the green residence by Gregory Ain, or what was left of it after a devastating fire about two years ago. Most of the house was very badly damaged in this fire. Uh, this is a view from the entrance towards the kitchen. Uh, the roof structure, uh, actually most of the roof structure survived because the ceiling had a one inch layer of uh, plaster. With the house, the only known set of drawings was lost. Uh, but our client, uh, uh, who really loved her Ain house, was absolutely determined to rebuild this. Now, the Gregory Ain archive is at UC Santa Barbara, which has the largest architectural drawing collection in the United States. Uh, it has the papers of many California modernists, many case study uh, architects are there, but they do not have any drawings of the greenhouse. And there is no mention of this house in any literature except for an oblique reference in Esther McCoy's 1984 book, The Second Generation. And she speaks about one house by Gregory Ain that has a butterfly roof, which is uh, our house. So we first had to convince the insurance company to not tear down anything until we could shore up the structure and carefully measure the charred remnants. We did, however, find in the archive one presentation drawing of our house that was cataloged as an unidentified project. So you enter here. This is the dining area, the kitchen. You have some built-in pieces, fireplace, the living room, a bookcase that originally separated a sleeping area, and then you have dressing and bathroom. On the lower level, this is the stair. Most of the area is a painting studio with some guest uh, quarters. But uh, we then made a very interesting discovery. We realized that our house was almost identical to a house that Gregory Ain had done in 1950 for the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Uh, so here again, entrance, dining, kitchen, fireplace, built-in furniture, living room, uh, this wall separating the uh, sleeping area. Uh, for uh, the, the house was part of a series that was curated by uh, Philip Johnson, who invited uh, significant contemporary architects, uh, people like uh, Marcel Breuer, Albert Frey, to do houses in the garden that museum visitors could then 
come and, and look at. So with that information and with uh, the measurements that we took and uh, uh, talk and, and sort of studying other aid houses and looking at the details, uh, we were able to create essentially a new set of construction drawings. And with that, we were then able to create a 3D model and to discuss it with the client and with the snippets, with a bit of information that we got on the drawings, we were then able to uh, uh, um, find out what the materials were and apply this to this 3D model. Now, this is what the house looked like a few months ago. Uh, the uh, uh, reconstruction is almost complete. The floor is completely new. The structure is completely new. The walls and the roof are original. Uh, basically, we kept every piece of framing that we were able to keep uh, to sort of uh, minimize the amount of new material. The uh, uh, post and beam glazing wall, however, is new. Uh, we were able to work with the uh, uh, state historical building code, which allowed us to install uh, laminated glass rather than dual glazing, which would have this sort of gasket here. But uh, with this, I'm uh, ending my part uh, of the talk uh, that is more about preserving buildings and Ravi will speak more about preserving uh, uh, the history. So um, we, we turn our discussion now uh, a bit towards the issue of race and the profession of architecture. Um, we just showed you the work of three architects whose projects that we've worked on. And um, as, as some of you may know, we've also worked on houses by John Lautner, uh, John um, uh, Richard Neutra, uh, and Charles and Ray Eames. But uh, we selected these three projects to show you today uh, because of the association of, of these three architects. Uh, they, they knew each other and they collaborated in various ways. And, um, and, and they were especially uh, closely tied in their uh, efforts against segregation, both in the profession of architecture and in society. Um, Paul Williams, the, the eldest, uh, was a black man born at the end of the 19th century in 1894. 30 years after the Civil War. Gregory Ayn, um, a white man born 14 years later in Philadelphia, uh, grew up in, in Lincoln Heights, Los Angeles. And uh, the third, uh, Quince, A. Quincy Jones, uh, also white, was uh, born uh, nearly 20 years after Williams in Kansas City. His parents moved to Los Angeles and, and he grows up in LA and Seattle. Um, Williams was uh, orphaned at the age of four and uh, adopted, I'm sorry, uh, I missed the pictures of uh, Ayn and, and Quincy Jones. Um, uh, so Paul Williams was orphaned at the age of four and adopted by a middle-class couple uh, who encouraged his artistic tendencies through um, and uh, through his perseverance and, and uh, the encouragement of his parents, uh, Williams attended uh, an art academy, um, the LA branch of a New York Bose Arts Studio, and eventually obtained an engineering degree from USC. He was the first African-American architect west of the Mississippi to be certified, the first black architect to be admitted to the AIA and later to the AIA College of Fellows. Um, Ain's parents uh, were socialists. Growing up, he spent time, um, I'm sorry, the, the photos are a little out of sequence. Um, uh, Ain, uh, Gregory Ains' parents were socialists. Growing up, he spent time on a cooperative farm and grew up aware of uh, the economic and racial disparities in society. He began uh, studies at USC, but dropped out um, uninterested in the Beaux-Arts educational model at the time. He apprenticed under Rudolf Schindler, 
and Richard Neutra before setting out on his own with partners jo uh, Joseph Johnson and Alfred Day. Uh, there was a third uh, architect that he partnered with, um, who I, I'll speak about a little bit later. Ain was deeply interested in developing affordable housing and especially in the post-war period. Jones studied architecture at the University of Washington and came back to LA after graduating in 1936. He worked briefly with Doug, Douglas Honnold, Burton Schutt, and uh, two years in Paul Williams' office. Uh, during the war, he enlisted in the Navy and upon his return, he partnered with Williams on a series of projects. While Paul Williams continued to build uh, exclusive custom homes for celebrities and wealthy clients out of the necessity of maintaining a viable practice. He was also interested in building uh, affordable housing for the middle and working classes in various parts of the world. Included in their commitment to modernism was a vision that all three of these architects shared of a new egalitarian society, a desegregated society. Quincy Jones and uh, Whitney Smith um, uh, worked on uh, the, the mutual housing project, which uh, Frank showed you earlier, um, the, the model house for that project. Um, and this, uh, this development originally had no religious or racial barriers. Sadly, the, the cooperative had to uh, give up on the desegregation idea due to objections from the nearby wealthy homeowners in Brentwood who felt that their properties would be devalued if people of color lived nearby. Economics were always cited as an excuse for racism. Jones and Williams uh, developed a lifelong relationship and friendship and uh, following World War II, the two collaborated on several projects including the Palm Springs uh, Town and Country Club shown here, uh, the, the the tennis club and, um, and various other projects, including a resort in Hawaii called Coconut Island. Gregory Ains' interest in affordable housing developments, uh, also with no racial or religious barring, financed through cooperatives, not banks, caught the attention of the FBI, who, who tracked him for two decades uh, for the possibility of him being a communist subversive. Though they couldn't find anything on him after 20 years, uh, they, they basically ruined his career. And, um, and this also necessitated him always having to partner with other people to stamp his projects. He's best known for the Modernique uh, housing uh, tract in Mar Vista and for the park plan homes in Altadena. Uh, the park plan homes had several uh, owners who were people of color. Ains is sometimes mentioned as the first architect to design a house that did not entertain the possibility of servants, uh, essentially for a new classless society. Gregory Ains also mentored another well-known uh, black architect, James H. Garrett who was co-sponsored by Ain and Paul Williams for his AIA membership. Garrett was the second black architect to be admitted into the AIA and Ain and Garrett had a partnership for several years, first at, at a building near Wilshire Boulevard and later in Silver Lake where they built an office, um, uh, especially for their practice on Hyperion Avenue. It's interesting how Ain's name uh, after some time and his reputation eventually survived the blacklisting by the FBI. But Garrett's long relationship or, or partnership with Ain is barely ever mentioned. One of Garrett's clients was the renowned civil rights lawyer, Lauren Miller, who represented black clients in, in numerous restrictive housing cases. His arguments with Thurgood Marshall in two historic ruling, rulings in the US Supreme Court overturned racial housing covenants. 
Two of his other clients were Hattie McDaniels and Ethel Waters, the actors. Cases like these opened up the formerly white neighborhoods such as Lafayette Square, where Paul Williams would build his own home to people of color in the 1950s. Another well-known black architect, um, Carrie Jenkins, worked for Quincy Jones in the 1940s, a graduate of USC. He was later partner at uh, uh, partner architect for the Martin Luther King Hospital in Watts and collaborated with the architects, Douglas Honnold and John Rex on projects. Often called uh, the grandfather of Los Angeles architecture by African-American architects, aside from the massive body of work that he accomplished in his lifetime, the most significant legacy of Paul Williams was the example he set for generations of architects to follow. Along with Julian Francis Abel, uh, active in Philadelphia in, and in North Carolina, and Hilliard Robinson, active in Washington, DC, a longtime teacher at Har Howard University, Williams is cited as a role model for many black architects throughout the 20th century. One should also be aware that though somewhat invisible in professional representation, there were hundreds of other accomplished black architects who didn't achieve the same recognition. Derek Spurlock Wilson's biographical dictionary of African-American architects includes 168 entries between 1865 and 1945 alone. This number would have increased dramatically uh, after the civil uh, rights era and, and the Equal Rights Amendment. In Los Angeles, Norma Merrick Sklarik was one of the first female executives uh, at Gruen Associates, becoming the first black woman to be licensed in California and to be admitted to the AIA College of Fellows. Many others await recognition. Fellow architects like A. Quincy Jones and Gregory Ain also played an important role in recognizing uh, Black architects' role uh, as role models, mentors, peers, and by mentoring young Black professionals who were, uh, who were entering the field. The 1940s and 50s were uh, especially pivotal in this transition. And similar to the rat, uh, the rat Pack's breaking of color barriers in Las Vegas, in the music industry, recognition and endorsement by celebrities like Lucille Ball, Danny Thomas, and Frank Sinatra certainly helped pave the way for mainstream America to accept these black architect professionals. The synthesis for certain parts of the country, um, at least, culminated in the 1960s. Yes, it's, it's an ongoing struggle. So now um, we will uh, join Jana and Frederick for a group discussion. Thank you, Frank and Ravi. That was that was fantastic. Appreciated the both your roles in that um, conversation and presentation. And the images are great. I know that one of the things that was so exciting about you know, bringing you in was having an opportunity to also take a peek um, into the Paul Williams home project that you're working on, which I think for all of you here who saw that, that's perhaps one of the first times that, that we've been offered that opportunity and it's very exciting. Um, I thought that a great point to start is to sort of tell everybody um, why you're here in a way, <laughs> like, how did you and Jana connect? Like, how are, can, and Jana, feel free to chime in too, but, um, you know, just would be great to be able to share how the, how the threads of LA life brought, um, brought you all together. Maybe I can start uh, uh, with that. So, uh, you know, the uh, famous uh, architectural photographer, Julius Schulman, left a very sizable uh, 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 amount of money to Woodbury University with the request to start uh, what is called the Julius Schulman Institute. And uh, I've been on the uh, advisory board of that since, uh, since it started. And the um, uh, idea is that every year a photographer is recognized who is not simply an architectural photographer, but sort of like bridges the two disciplines of uh, uh, architectural photography and really 
art. And now I can take absolutely zero credit for uh, 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 the work that, um, that Jana started to do because that was uh, the executive director of the Schulman Institute, Barbara Bestor, uh, who's an architect here in Los Angeles. And it was her idea to essentially commission uh, or ask uh, a janitor to start to document the um, uh, uh, the work, and I'm, I'm sure that uh, uh, you can speak more uh, about that. And so uh, what happened was that we went to the opening of this exhibition, and I was just kind of mesmerized by the the extraordinary images. And I think we have to remember that uh, that Jana is not just uh, an architectural photographer, she, she is an artist. And like every artist, she will look at the same things that we look at, but she will see them in a different way. And every good artist will sort of be able to help you see the things the way he or she sees them. And that is exactly, I think, what for me happened when I was looking at these photos, because you know here was the work of an architect um, who, uh, and I have to admit, I didn't know very, very well. I didn't know more about Paul Williams than maybe other people. But, but through these images, I was just uh, uh, so drawn into the work, the sort of the, the atmospheric quality of the images, the, 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 this, the, the very sort of uh, quiet sort of uh, and very sort of patient eye just comes across in, in this. And so, you know, I, I uh, sought her out and introduced myself and we started a conversation. <laughs> and uh, so that's, uh, at least from my part, but I, I really would love to hear uh, uh, and, uh, Janice. And, uh, and, and before Johnny goes, uh, we were just blown away at that exhibition. Uh, the, the images were so beautiful and evocative and it didn't even matter that they were of architecture. <laughs> and uh, so, so that's, that's where we, we just fell in love with her work. I remember meeting you very briefly that night, Robbie. But what I remember better is having a very long conversation with Frank and how wonderful that was. And I believe that's the night that I learned that Williams's house was on the market. So it was the oh. first time I was talking to a lot of people about his work at once. And it was also the beginning of meeting architects in Los Angeles and meeting people like you and kind of beginning to understand how large this world was that's sort of separate from the art world, but adjacent to it, but still has all these other things going on in it. And then later, it was really wonderful that you were the architects hired to restore his house. I can't tell you how many times people say, I pass by the house and it's wrapped up. There's a fence around it. What's happening to it? And then I get to say, well, I know the person who bought it and she really cares about the house. She knows that it's important. And I also know the architects who are getting it back into its original condition and they care very much as well and are going to do a fantastic job. So it's, it's always a pleasure to be able to say that to people. That's, that's that's really uh, uh, wonderful, and 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 I think that really is uh, absolutely uh, accurate. Uh, I think uh, you know when you're talking about sort of the legacy of uh, of an architect. I mean, uh, the preservation of this legacy takes on many many different sort of uh, facets. One is really sort of the restoration of a building. But you know, we always say that we are not just interested in sort of the preservation of a building. We're also really interested in preservation of history. But you know, then the work that 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 you know artists will do, or art historians or architectural historians will do. I mean, all of that sort of has to build momentum to sort of really uh, uh, protect uh, uh, or sometimes revive kind of the the uh, the, the legacy of of uh, of, uh, uh, of an artist or, or or an architect. And we all know that there are uh, untold. Uh, uh, circumstances are completely out of our control of, you know, what, how uh, uh, the work of one person is recognized while the per, uh, work of another person that may, may be equally as interesting goes unrecognized. So, so uh, uh, a bit, bit uh, I really think that, you know, what we are doing is sort of working maybe just on one end and what you Jana are doing is working on another end on exactly the to me the same uh, idea about uh, uh, you know Pre preserving yeah. a, a legacy and, yeah. and it's it's always uh, 
it's always a, a, a bit intimidating when, when you start on these projects and, and it's a big responsibility as well as a, an honor that's bestowed on, on someone to, to preserve something. And, uh, and so the, the first step we do is really you know, immerse ourselves in the history of, of this person. And, and uh, it's, it's such a, a, rich, um, a rich history and a rich life that, that uh, Paul Williams had. And, and so it's, uh, there's, every day there's something that we discover a different aspect uh, of his life and his work. Well, I love that story. You know, I mean, yes, art does bring us all together in wonderful ways. Um, in, and those openings are so important that we just can't have any more right now, right? It is so frustrating. So much magic um, comes together when when we're able to be together in person. It's so, it's so moving. Um, I think it'd be wonderful to maybe touch a little bit more on this, um, the relationships of this legacy. You know, when we talked about it, you know, this sort of, you know, moving through homes, but, but and you also did present nicely on some of their relationships, but perhaps, um, you know, if there's any more that we can kind of dig into in terms of how, um, you know, how, how, how did Jones start working with Williams and how did Ayn start and meet, you know, Williams and how, you know, what was, yeah, I mean, I, I can you like, I don't know, it'd be interesting if there's anything else you've gleaned or learned through your uh, research about, you know, maybe a more sort of personal side or, or how that, how their work worked. Um, I mean, uh, uh, I, I rely heavily on, on um, these uh, biographies by Karen Hudson and, uh, and something called the Paul Williams Project that was undertaken by the University of Memphis which uh, did a, a thorough job in kind of uh, chronicling um, the, the projects and, uh, and, and basically making a, a master list more or less. But um, so uh, uh, Jones, um, when he returned to LA, uh, he had worked in various different offices and then he spent uh, about two years in Paul Williams's office and it's interesting um, that this kind of this white man of some somewhat privilege would choose to go and, and work in an office of someone like uh, Paul Williams. So that that's telling in itself that that he would have been uh, that Williams would have been respected uh, in the profession in, in general. And uh, and then there was this uh, uh, Shortly afterwards, the war began, the World War II, and uh, and and uh, the, the the two men were kind of deployed to different places. And when when um, Williams came back, uh, he he had this opportunity to work on these projects. Um, uh, I'm sorry, when when Williams and uh, Jones came back, they, they had the opportunity to work on these projects and and decided to partner so it's uh it's it's kind of telling that uh that they respected each other uh to enough to form this partnership mm -hmm. on on those projects mm -hmm. but i would also maybe like to mention something else that connects the three of them uh you know paul williams is now uh best remembered for his his very, very beautiful, very grand houses. And, you know, that's absolutely, that's, uh, 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 those are things that one uh, really does need to pay attention to. But the reality is that he did an enormous amount of work for um, uh, low to middle income uh, um, uh, uh, clients. And uh, he developed ideas for, for housing, really for kind of the, the masses in a way. And this is something, uh, and this part of his his oeuvre has been overshadowed, and I think it's really important to sort of uh, you know bring this to the forefront and sort of make make a point of that because you know one of the sort of central ideas of, of, of modernism really was to sort of provide better housing to everyone, provide uh, you know uh, a decent uh, uh, housing, decent schools to 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 everyone, 
and 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 uh, it's it's very you can see this very clearly in in Ain's work. You can see this maybe less clearly, but you can also see that in uh, A. Quincy Jones's work. But you can also very much see that in the work that Paul Williams did. Again, not the things that are better known and celebrated, but his involvement in 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 in, in housing, not just in Los, in Los Angeles area, by the way, but uh, you know across the country and and other. Uh, uh, Across the world, yeah, um, and and um, I didn't really explain those images that were up in in those two books, which basically were kind of uh, pattern books, you know, which had floor plans and elevations of these modern houses, and uh, they were sort of the the, the modern equivalent of uh, of the Sears and Roebuck housing catalogs that existed at the the turn of the century. And so he was making accessible to to all uh, through this book um, these these ideas for different ways of living, and so so you know people could sort of build their own uh, based on, on these books. Yeah, and um, that actually is a nice segue because I was curious to know from Jana a little bit more about you know she you know in her in her book and and the many. Um, buildings and residences and homes that she documented, there are several of um, some of these planned communities, um, the more accessible communities that that Williams did. And so I think it'd be interesting to hear from Jana her perspective in, in terms of, you know, being out there making art, looking at these, maybe what, what she was thinking about or feeling. I love that Frank and Ravi mentioned those two books that um, Williams published, which had floor plans that people could use in the mid 1940s when those books came out. And also when he was doing lots of other projects, including a planned community here in LA for black GIs returning from the war. Um, lots of people suddenly had money to build their own new houses for the first time. And he seemed like someone who was really interested in making that accessible. So publishing those two books, which meant that anyone could have a Williams house or a Williams design house, or for someone like me who isn't building her own house necessarily, I look at those and I begin to understand what I want out of a house, what makes sense to me, what I'm interested in. So I just, the opportunity to look at all of those plans um, one after the other is something that feels really special to me and I appreciate him so much for that right, and right. the uh, the point about the, that he did so many different kinds of things is really important that um, architect to the stars nickname gets thrown around a lot and that often overshadows all this other work but there was so much of it for people you know all the way up and down the economic spectrum. So I, I really appreciate you talking about that as well. And looking at his own house, which is more modest. He could have done any number of things, but he chose this relatively contained structure for himself. And it's really neat to see it, to see right. what he's doing with it. I mean, I mean, at the same time, you know, that's why I mentioned at the beginning, uh, I didn't realize at the beginning that uh, Paul Williams, he was already, he was 58 years old and his children were adults. And so this was really a house for him and his wife. So, you know, there was no need to, to make any, anything bigger. Of course, you know, a lot of other architects, we will not name names, would have made, you know, kind of the grandest thing. But, but uh, uh, I think uh, part of his work that I find so interesting is he was uh, uh, an absolute master at sort of you know, developing plans with like the most interesting practical details, you know, how a house has to function. And that house in particular, you know, it's it's really sort of designed uh, for comfortable living, but also for very, very sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 for entertain, uh, 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 to entertain. So you have these sort of two main living spaces that open to the garden space and, uh, you know, from the living room, from the dining room, we have access to this whole kind of back of house, uh, these spaces, the kitchen and, and, and things like that. And so, so he, above all, really sort of knew how to make space and how to make space that was usable to anyone at any level of society. 
And that is something that comes, I think, out of a deep sort of respect for his clients. It comes out of a deep, deep respect, really sort of for, for his uh, uh, fellow uh, uh, humans. Uh, it's not sort of the architect's ego who says, you know, this is what you, this is how you're going to live. It's really it's somebody who, who who listens very carefully to what his clients uh, uh, want, or maybe sort of hears things that the client doesn't uh, know how to uh, how to express. I think it, it we should maybe also add that very recently, and this has been in the news, uh, the Getty jointly with USC has acquired the Paul Williams archive. And this is really fantastic news because um, it will allow many, many more people to research this work that really needs to be researched, that really needs to be studied. Um, uh, again, because we have this sort of like slightly warped idea of who Paul Williams was, you know, the architect to the stars. And, and you know, his work is by any measure it's uh, uh, staggering. I mean, he did he did thousands of projects, you know, as I mentioned, at all scales. But if you sort of think about everything that he had to go through as an African American man at the time that he was practicing, it's 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 absolutely astonishing. I mean, it's it's uh, uh, and 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 so I think it's not just a matter of ar architectural history. Uh, uh, to study this work, it's really, it's, it's a question of cultural history. And, and I think that, uh, uh, you know, here really, again, uh, uh, the more people can get involved in researching this work, the better. And so I'm very, very happy that the archive is now going to be accessible via uh, the Getty and, and USC. And more and more will be uncovered. Mm -hmm. and, um, so something that I wanted to bring up uh, about this house was that, uh, uh, this was his own house, kind of done uh, in his middle age, as Frank uh, mentioned earlier. And so um, uh, th that's always a, b both a challenge to an architect, like, you know, you can do anything you want in your own house. Uh, and, it, and it becomes your, your calling card in a way. And so it's interesting to see what he, uh, what he included in this house. And, uh, and, and though, um, uh, though it's say modestly scaled for for that neighborhood, which is full of grand mansions, um, it's a very elegant and gracious house, and and really is made for entertaining, and and reflected, uh, you know, who he and his wife were, and in all these photos you can tell, you know, he was truly a gentleman architect. You know, he was born in another century, and and uh, the way he always dressed and and presented himself, um, he, here he, he, he was presenting who he was in, in, through his work. And, uh, and, but at the same time, he, he maintained this interest in, in providing you know, fair housing for everyone. And, and so uh, you know, every, every time we read about him, you find these, uh, these other projects. And, one, uh, one project, for example, were, were these bubble houses um, that was developed uh, by Wallace Neff and by Williams, and they collaborated on some of them. And the idea was to you know, provide housing uh, around the world affordably. Um, these, these houses were kind of balloons um, that would then have a, a layer of concrete built around it, and then you take away the balloon and you build another and another. And um, and uh, I believe some were uh, executed in in uh, Central America and some in Africa, and uh, and so Neff and Williams maintained this relationship. And apparently, uh, I can't remember who was older. Probably Neff was older. Uh, that late in his life, uh, he would have these salons uh, at at his home in in Pasadena or Altadena and invite uh, uh, Williams to come and speak about different subjects. And uh, so, uh, so he, he, was, he was always interested in, in this uh, idea of, of housing everyone comfortably. But, but also really interested in the idea of collaborating. I mean, throughout his career, he works with so many different architects. 
uh, you know, including uh, on LAX. I mean, he was really just an advisor. He's now always sort of, uh, 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 maybe his role is slightly exaggerated and he's sort of sometimes uh, referred to as the architect of the theme building, which is not true. And it has to do with a photograph of Julius Schulman where he sort of, he, he's, he's oh, you're, you, you stand in front of this building and Schulman was incredibly good at sort of constructing a photo. And, and but, but uh, uh, you know, really, uh, uh, it's, it says a lot about him uh, and, you know, collaborating with all of these different people throughout his entire career. And also, I think, uh, mentoring younger people, sort of working, making sure that other people could maybe sort of achieve what he had achieved. And so uh, this is really, uh, uh, this uh, says much about the man, not just the architect, but about, about who he was as a, as, 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 as a person. Well, um, Frank, I'm, I'm happy that you brought up the archive because that was going to be my next question to both of you. <laughs> and so you've kind of touched on it a little bit, but maybe, um, you know, before we open it up for questions, just to be conscientious of time, um, if there, you know, is there one thing that you are looking forward to learning or, or investigating or, or is there something that, um, yeah, that you personally hope to kind of discover or are or, or curious about that's in the archive. Um, and I'd love well, for Jana to answer that too. Well, uh, uh, one thing that I didn't mention was that one of the biggest challenges on this project was that we did not have access to the original drawings. And uh, we are not even sure if they are in the archive or not. And the reason this became very difficult was because when we discovered the issues about the structure and the foundation, we did not know what type of foundation we actually have. So we literally had to sort of cut out large holes through the slab and, you know, uh, somebody had to climb in there to sort of look at what the, what the foundation is. Or in the Lanai, above the Lanai, we have a terrace and we discovered that the steel posts that are embedded in that ribbon uh, and that ribbon window had corroded. Now, we did not know, again, because we didn't have the original drawings, whether these posts continued through the brick or how, how tall they were. We didn't even know it was one layer or two layers of brick. And so again, we had to do a little bit of archeology. span So you carefully open up places to sort of see what is in there. And then we actually discovered that the steel beam or the steel post, I'm sorry, continues between two layers of brick all the way down to, 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 to the ground. And uh, in the end, the corrosion was not uh, uh, so bad that we had to replace that. But, but, but uh, you know, this is, quite, what, what, uh, this is why the drawings become so important. I mean, on the Gregory Ain house, we basically had to construct the drawing. So what, what we're hoping for yeah. is actually that uh, the drawings were mislabeled or were rolled up in another set, which, which has happened repeatedly on, on other projects where, um, where archives say, oh, those, that set of drawings don't exist. And so, which was uh, the case in the Gregory Ain house. And um, there was another project we were looking at, uh, the Neutra archives, where they are put into a different folder or a different tube. Yeah. And uh, so we're hoping that that's the case and we'll, yeah. we'll find these drawings. And, and just to sort of what, one, one last comment, it was the same problem with the pilot house because the A. Quincy Jones office burnt down in the 1961 Bel Air fire and with that, the drawings. Now that house was a collaboration between A. Quincy Jones and Whitney Smith and the Whitney Smith archive is at UC Santa Barbara. So we were able to get drawings from the from the Whitney Smith archive, but I think we've talked now long enough about archive questions. <laughs> yeah, Donna, what are you what are you hoping to hoping to find or discover? Wonder. First, just a really quick note for everyone about the archive. Um, my understanding is that it's something like five hundred plus tubes, mm -hmm. and they're just stuffed with drawings. And because of the pandemic there hasn't been the opportunity to get in and look at them and digitize them. So it's a mystery, but we know there's so much work packed in there. So it's very exciting knowing that it's out there. One thing I'm really curious about that I may never see is his office records, his correspondence. And that seems to be what was lost in 1992. There was a rumor for a long time that everything was gone. And it turns out that's not true, of course. So I want to see 
I want to see what's in there. And I'm really curious about seeing his hand, seeing drawings that he did. So often I go into homes and they don't have the plans. So I've seen just a handful of them. And I would really like to see more of what he did, knowing that there are so many little details in these houses that he actually drew in himself and that he was thinking of every little curve and every banister. Um, just seeing that is really exciting and just makes me want to continue my exploration of his work. So that's what I want. I want to see, I want his hand. I want to see his drawings. <laughs> right. One, one, one thing I'm uh, really curious about also is uh, um, it's sort of a mystery exactly who worked in his office, you know, in, in such a long career. Like and, payroll, like I want to see the payroll. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, but one thing you can find is uh, quite often, you know, drawings are, are signed by um, or initialed by certain people and, and there may be architects who are still around that will be able to identify who, who worked on which projects. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, hopefully through uh, uh, the, the initials, the, the payroll documents apparently have been lost. That's uh, uh, what uh, uh, was mentioned in the 92 uh, fire. I mean, to me, uh, one has to think of the drawing the, that the architect does. It's a little bit like, you know, the music score. And, and, and so, so it's, all, it's always very interesting to sort of look at you know, different composers and how, you know, what their scores look like, mm -hmm. because it, it's, it tells you very much about their thinking. And, 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 and also, you know, the drawings that I have seen so far, uh, that are probably the same things that are, are, are published, I mean, they are incredibly precise. I mean, they, they are so uh, uh, carefully uh, executed, so beautifully drawn. And, and, you know, the details are, are just so uh, uh, elegantly thought out that I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing more of these. And I, I, you know, I hope that the Getty will sort of publish several volumes of, <laughs> of, of drawings. But, um, uh, you know, that is, that is really something that uh, the drawing is, is, is a tool for the architect, is a tool to examine an idea and to convey this idea to other people. And, and so the drawings really are, uh, uh, they are, typically just sort of a, a font of, a, you know, very, very sort of rich source of information. The, the, the other thing that's also incredibly interesting about uh, Williams's career is uh, he's, he's a, a person who spans from the Beaux-Arts tradition to modernism. And mm -hmm. uh, unlike a, a lot of the LA modernists who, who came uh, who enters, uh, who entered the profession kind of deeply entrenched uh, with a fixed set of ideas and then spends the rest of their life kind of, you know, uh, reinforcing their, their convictions. He actually explores the whole range of ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a beautiful way to, to put it. Um, I just uh, want to let everyone know it's six o'clock now. And if um, anybody has any questions that they haven't already dropped into Q&A or the chat, I'm, there's a few that I'm gonna, um, I'm going to read out. Um, there is one in the, um, in the chat about um, how did you find and connect the unidentified floor plan at UCSB archive as Ames? The Gregory Ain um, floor plan. So, so yeah, it, that was in the the Garrett Ekbo file. And no, no, that's that, that, no, that's that, not correct. No, 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 there is. Uh, uh, so, the, uh, Garrett Ekbo was the landscape architect, and his archive is at UC Berkeley. And we did find there a plan for the landscape. But uh, so what what we did is when we were going through the Gregory Ain archive. I mean, you first look for anything with the name Green. That was the name of the client, Marjorie Green, who, by the way, was the niece of the Green and Green brothers, a very interesting woman in her own uh, rights. So there was nothing under Green. Then we looked under Reed's, uh, the, the, the address. Uh, there was nothing uh, 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 under the address. And then just on a hunch, we sort of said, you know, you have various projects that are listed, that are cataloged as unidentified. Obviously they don't know what it is. And so we asked if we could see those, 
So they, they, you know, they, they sent us that. And then, you know, lo and behold, we get a drawing and we said, this is our house, this is the house. But unfortunately it is a presentation drawing. It does not have any technical information, no dimensions or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And so, so we were, uh, um, uh, we, we found that, that one uh, uh, drawing, actually, uh, it, I'm sorry, two drawings and one of the lower level, uh, but that was, you know, that was sheer luck. And it was really sort of just trying to, let's also check for things that they, that they don't know what, what it is. And, and, uh, and then, of course, we knew what the, the floor plan looked like. And, and we also knew of, uh, of Ames famous um, house that was built uh, as an exhibition house at MoMA. And, uh, and, you know, we had been looking at these things separately. And uh, it was uh, Sasha Plotnikova, mm -hmm. who was uh, the project architect in our office, at, at, at who, the time. Who, who made the connection and said, this is the the MoMA house plan, except it's two stories, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and that was a, a real aha moment. And then then we found that all the detailing and everything was almost identical. Now I, I read about this uh, this recent exhibition that was a retrospective of the the Ain um, exhibition, um, where. Uh, um, the, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm blanking on the, the two historians that presented this. Uh, was it very good? Mm, no, um, it was for a Venice Biennial mm -hmm. exhibition. In any case, th uh, they were saying that uh, one of the projects that died for, for AIN uh, because of the FBI involvement uh, was a, a very large housing project that was going to be in the Valley called the Los Angeles uh, uh, Housing community or something like that. And, um, and so when, uh, when Philip Johnson approached him about doing a project, uh, this was his comeuppance was, uh, was to actually put one of the plans from from that dead housing project uh, uh, into the MoMA garden. And uh, this was, of course, published in, uh, was it How Beautiful mm -hmm. and seen by millions of people and Marjorie Green would have seen that and said, you know, I'd like one of those houses, <laughs> even though she had a, a very steep site. And so uh, that allowed her to put her studio beneath uh, the, the MoMA exhibition house. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so uh, you know, making that connection to the MoMA house was a, a very special moment. Yeah, there was another challenge that we we, we also we didn't talk about that uh, because uh, so our house was built in 1952. Now, uh, and uh, Robbie talked about that Gregory Ain was in partnership with Day and Johnson. On the permit, only the names Day and Johnson appear. Gregory Ain does not appear on that, and. Uh, uh, but we knew through this sort of research that he was involved with that and our client knew that. And this actually has to do with uh, Gregory Ain being essentially blacklisted. And, and uh, uh, you know, the FBI really sort of ended his career. This house is uh, one of the two last houses that he built. And so this is another sort of aspect of kind of, you know, social history that is uh, uh, overlooked or not known uh, uh, well enough. I mean, what was happening, uh, uh, you know, not just to Gregory, but many other intellectuals. Historian uh, Anthony Fontenot, um, who teaches at Woodbury, uh, has has written a book, and and we're waiting for that to come out, uh, hopefully soon, and uh, which which will uncover this um, this whole history of of Ain and and. Uh, both his interest in social housing and, and being blacklisted, uh, I believe, will be in, in that book. Um, I'd also like to uh, to identify that um, uh, our friends at the Modern Committee, um, Chris Nichols, who, who's at LA Magazine, uh, was able to to dig uh, further in in research and found out kind of personal history of Marjorie Green. Uh, who that Ain House was uh, built for, and uh, it turned out that uh, she later married the um, somebody who was one of the founders of the Barnstall Art Center, and uh, so so it's kind of interesting how these uh, connections happen in, in, in yeah, LA history.
Yeah, LA, LA was a small town then, and it kind of is. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> um, we have a couple more. One who I missed from the chat earlier, I apologize. Um, Frank and Ravi, you're doing an amazing uh, work, doing some amazing work to preserve the history and convey a strong message of equality through architecture. Have you thought about projecting your works to other countries, for example, Australia, to preserve the indigenous history? Thanks, Namiko. Well, you know, we we live in Los Angeles. Uh, I'm not originally from Los Angeles. I'm from Switzerland. I've been here for 30 years. Ravi grew up here, and I think uh, you know. Uh, we know, I think, the history of this place, um, uh, um, you know, relatively well. And I think that is the most important thing. I think, I think when, you, when, you, when you are talking about uh, a preservation, you really have to have a very good understanding of what you are uh, uh, conserving, what you are uh, uh, preserving. And, you know, as interesting as it is, you know, absolutely for us, maybe more as almost sort of like private citizens, to do research of uh, 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 architectural histories of other uh, cultures, um, uh, it, it, one has to encourage the, this research being done by people who are more familiar with that. Otherwise it is, you know, it's, 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 it's maybe, uh, uh, you, you invariably will miss uh, 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 clues. Well, uh, well, that's, that's one point of view. Um, <laughs> there are, that sounds like a great uh, sabbatical year project or something like that. And, and there, there are examples of great histories being uncovered by outsiders who, you know, because sometimes when you're entrenched in your own community, you overlook things that uh, that that people can see through fresh eyes. Right, right, right. Yes, <laughs> I love <laughs> that. So he's, he's always that's planning right. a sabbatical. So exactly. Uh, that's why there's two of you. That's why there's two. <laughs> Maybe <a bad> call <laughs> from Australia. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All expenses paid, please. Yes. Um, did um, this is another question? Did Williams work with any specific landscape architects? That's that a that? very good question. Hmm. I'm, I'm not sure whether, uh, well, of course, uh, uh, well, Garrett Ekbo, oh, I'm sorry, well, um, no, no, I'm, 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 I'm mixing up everybody's names that we've <laughs> talked about today, but Quincy Jones did work with the Garrett Ekbo. Uh, I would be curious to uh, find out who, who he actually worked with. Yeah, yeah, and, I, don't, um, I don't know. And, you know, one of the, the last images that uh, I showed in my section uh, was, uh, uh, was Williams in a, a very staged photograph that Julius Schulman took of him presenting a model to a, a client, it seems. And that model is his own house. And uh, I've, I've seen that picture before uh, at a very small scale. And when I blew it up, I realized oh, this is his own house. And it shows something about the landscaping that's very interesting that we're gonna show to our client. Um, it, it had this kind of hedge that kind of encircles the garden and, and creates a kind of Chinese design at the entrance. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but he, he may have even designed a, a, a lot of the landscaping himself, uh, um, certainly in these illustrations uh, of, the, of the pattern books of the houses, um, they're beautifully landscaped. Mm -hmm. But, but that, 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 I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. Before, just before he opened his own practice, he did work under a landscape architect. So I don't know who he worked with, but that uh -huh. there, he did try to figure some of those things out for himself. So I wouldn't be surprised if he did a decent amount of it, but I don't no. know. Either. I mean, that is a really, really interesting question. And, and uh, uh, thank you to whoever uh, 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 posed that question. I think it's something that we will really also uh, do a little more research into. Um, this is one, another one. How do you navigate the needs, desires of a contemporary owner client while still respecting the integrity of the original architect's vision? Well, um, I mean, part of it is, is a kind of joint discovery and, uh, and showing them what we know about the project and, and um, and for for the you know as owners um, develop an understanding of what they have, uh, this the balance of uh, you know historic preservation 
and one's own needs uh, come into play. And, and so um, the, the more you realize the importance of the historic fabric, the less you want to change of it. At the same time, you know, th there are modern things like wiring and plumbing and heating that, uh, that sometimes you, you have to make interventions uh, partly because the, the old equipment is obsolete and, and you have uh, different needs in, in, in uh, contemporary times. And I think it's always sort of a very delicate line between, you know, making a house into a museum piece, which is maybe not what one should do, unless it is like the Eames house. I mean, that is, that is a museum piece. It's open to the public as a museum piece. Nobody lives in there. But, but, you know, uh, a, a house, uh, you know, as, as Ravi said, I mean, if you look at, you know, other places where you have houses or buildings that are 300 years old, well, at some point they introduced central heating and they introduced electrical wiring and, 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 and the phone line. So uh, I, think, I think it is absolutely possible to update a house. One has to do that with great respect. I think the respect starts where you, 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 uh, you know, as Ravi said, you study very carefully what the house is about, and you make uh, interventions as respectful as as possible. Uh, that that is all, that's also a great sort of challenge, and 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 really sort of uh, 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 you know it, it, it takes a lot of work. It takes uh, you know, a lot of discussion also with with uh, with the client, and you know sometimes it is a situation where you just have to say, well, this these are the windows we have. It's not possible to make, you know, a floor to ceiling, wall to wall opening unless we completely ruin the house. We don't want to do that, you know. So, so, so. Uh, but, but at the same time, you know, that um, owning a historic house doesn't mean you're kind of enslaved to, to, to this um, history or or a, a previous version of the house and. Uh, one can completely personalize a, a house. You can reassign spaces for for your individual needs and and uh, and and really make it your own. And um, and we've found that repeatedly on on you know historic properties that we've restored but adapted for the new client's needs. But but it it is you know it is slightly a slippery slope because I think when, when, when you say that uh, you maybe have to uh, uh, state and hope that this sort of adapting to current use is done as carefully and as respectfully and with as much knowledge as, uh, as possible because um, uh, uh, um, so I, you know, I did a lot of work around John Lawton. I did a, the first book on him, and then we, we restored the chemosphere. But um, uh, Lautner himself was very, very open to the buildings being changed, and he thought that you know a house has to adapt to its new owners. Uh, and and while yes, that is absolutely true, and we can all sort of um, uh, agree to that. Uh, that has sometimes led to you know unspeakable things being done. <laughs> house and people saying you know oh you know Lautner thought that the house should change and th so <laughs> this is what I'm doing and so 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 I, 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 when you're dealing with with uh, with a historic building it requires a certain amount of, 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 of knowledge it's uh, and, and again re respect and, and technical and expertise I mean you know all of these projects I mean there's there's small armies of experts that, that are involved I mean we are just you know one of the people that you know there's a, a huge amount of sort of technical expertise but it, you know that, aside that, from, uh, uh, is involved aside from the the technical aspects is you know philo philosophically like n knowing uh what you can change without changing the character of the house yeah. and and that's where it's good to work with a professional well it's interesting that you mentioned that because um we have an attendee um whose father um a civil engineer and contractor um worked with Williams and a Quincy Jones 
Mm. And in particular, she was saying on his steel framed house that was lost in the Beller fire. But her question, which I think is interesting is what was the role of contractors in their work? Um, I don't know if that's anything you've gleaned or if those that's again, something to be discovered in the, um, in the archive. Look, Frank Lloyd Wright famously said that to do a good project, you need three things. You need a good architect, you need a good client, and you need a good builder. And he called that the Holy Trinity. And when one thing did it work, it was the unholy Trinity. And, and but you know, uh, uh, none of these architects could do their work without a builder who understands what they're doing. I mean, you know, when we do these restorations, we try to involve the builders as soon as possible because they will have an expertise. They will know how to do things that, you know, we, 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 we don't, you know, that's why, you know, the pilot house, uh, Debbie Ross, a, a woman contractor with a lot of experience. And, and, you know, we could not have done this project without her because she would, even when we had ideas, she would be the one who would say, look, this is the way to do that or on the Gregory Ain and the, the uh, Paul Williams house, we're working uh, with uh, Bonomar Construction, the father and son and uh, several other people. They also have the enormous experience, very, very uh, good uh, subcontractors. And all of them, you know, they bring their knowledge and their, uh, their expertise to a project. And, uh, you know, as an architect, you have to tap into that. You have to encourage people to sort of, you know, offer their input, their advice. And, and, and uh, uh, we have been very lucky to uh, have uh, uh, worked with a number of really, really uh, interesting, uh, very, very good uh, contractors. It is essential when you're doing a project like that, it is absolutely essential. Uh, you have to make sure that everyone understands the importance of the work, how careful the work needs to be done uh, and, and uh, you know, there's, luckily there are people who are as um, uh, excited or obsessed as we are to, you know, work on these things, but you and cannot it, do anything without a, a, a proper builder. And, it, and it's really great when, when a builder understands uh, what the project is and, and is enthusiastic about it. And it's, it's not just a, um, a job, you know. Right, and, and, and that's, enthusiasm goes a long way, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Um, related to that, um, there was a comment in the chat, which I, which begged me to, um, this, to put together this question, but are, have any of the homes you've worked on um, designated as landmarks or potential landmarks, I guess, because that would then sort of impact how you work with them, I would assume. So um, just, just throwing that out there. Yeah. Uh, the, uh... There have been some that we worked on that were later uh, after completion designated. And uh, there are some that, uh, for example, the Ain House um, that we uh, at least had the, the city recognize that it's a landmark, which enables us to preserve the, the entirety of the, the original design without uh, updating it to um, to current codes mm. um, um, I mean while we do we, we do make an effort to uh, structurally comply with current needs and so forth but for example that Gregory Ain house had an entire wall of glass facing the the lake which uh, by current codes you know we would have to either frame in steel or or have uh, large panels of sheer wall which would have ruined the house and and so we were able to kind of retroactively um, uh, get, recognition. get re recognition by the office of state historic resources and and uh, but yes we have worked on a number of, of, of projects that are either uh, what is called cultural historic monument of the city of Los Angeles which gives a certain amount of protection uh, the pilot house for example was already a monument and that then allowed us to apply for what is called the Mills Act. Uh, so we did the whole application for that. And that then sort of allows the owner to deduct the expenses of a restoration from the taxable income. Now other houses that we, or other buildings that we have worked on have not been uh, uh, protected. 
Uh, others are have the, the highest level of protection. We are actually currently working also on the restoration of John Lautner, his own house. Uh, and that is actually on the national register. I mean, that is, that's, uh, uh, that has sort of the highest level of protection. We're working on a, on a really interesting project, which is the Church of the Epiphany, which is the oldest existing Episcopal church in Los Angeles, but it was a center for the Chicano civil rights movement. And we just got listed uh, last year on the, uh, included on the national register of historic places. That's a, that's a very big deal actually. And, and, and one of the few Latino sites that yeah, have, have yeah. been recognized in, in the National Register. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, the thing is that people very often, they are kind of afraid of this and they say, oh, you know, if it is uh, listed as, 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 a, as a cultural historic monument, I can't, you know, I'm limited to what I can do to the house. Yes, that is true to some degree. So you cannot turn, you know, the 1960s house into a Tuscan villa. But on the other hand, it gives you great, great advantages. I mean, you know, the, 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 the example that Robbie mentioned that we were able to recreate uh, what was essentially 1950s architectural aesthetic meeting uh, uh, current uh, code. And, and uh, uh, when you, uh, you have to look at these uh, uh, codes as uh, uh, a way to help you navigate a very complicated process. And, and what, what, one thing I just wanted to mention uh, that's one of the most important tools in, in preserving these houses is really do the documentation of it and mm -hmm. photography is repeatedly the, the thing that, you know, we, we look through magnifying glasses at, at details from old photographs. And so, you know, the work that that Jana does and, and people like Julia Schulman, those become such valuable resources. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, it's time to wrap up, but I, I feel like I've been doing a lot of talking too. So I wanted to throw the ball to Jana and see if there's something she um, has been wanting to ask you. <laughs> um, no pressure, Jana, but just throwing that out there. I just want to say that it's really a pleasure to hear you talk about your work in depth like this and be able to look at it while you're talking about it. That was fascinating and so much fun. So thank you so much for doing this and talking about it. And I, I, I guess I'm generally curious about how the word spreads about this work, how you do one project where you're restoring something, rebuilding something, and how it, how you get these, this other work, if it's word of mouth or just what that looks like. It's, it's mostly been through word of mouth and, um, and, and, you know, people know of, of certain um, firms in LA that, uh, that, that work on these kind of houses. And, um, and everyone has a slightly different way of approaching these projects. And, so, um, so you know, we have a certain way that that appeals to certain clients, and mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, it's been yeah, essentially yeah. through word of mouth and and publications, you know, of of people, other people talking about the projects. But you know, the first uh, major restoration that we did was was of the chemosphere, the John Lautner, this octagon that sits on a column. And you know that came about because I had uh, edited the first book on Lautner, was in charge of the archive, and so when the current owner bought the house, you know he asked us, "Would we be interested in 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 restoring that?" And I almost fell out of the car, and I said, "Yes, I <laughs> would be very interested." And 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 then uh, you know uh, the next house, the next project that we did was actually the uh, the Eames house. There were some projects in between, but then the Eames house. Uh, and that came because we had worked on the chemosphere and, uh, uh, you know, they had a very, very careful uh, uh, interview process and they, uh, you know, asked us all kinds of questions. What would you do here? What would you do there? And, and uh, you know, at one point we said, you know, you should treat the house as if it were an old painting. It just needs to be cleaned. You don't need to sort of scrape the paint off the canvas and reapply it. And, and there was a particular example that, you know, if there's a, a, a piece of broken glass, what would you do? And we said, well, if it's not leaking, leave it. Because, you know, these are these sort of like traces that create the atmosphere of a house. This is the patina of a house. 
and it's so important to to first recognize that and to and to respect that because once you remove this patina if you can see that a house has been restored you've gone too far and once you rest, once you remove this patina there's no turning back mm. and and so so uh, uh, our approach has always been to not make a house that was built in 1940 look like it was built 10 years ago. There's just something wrong about that. And, and even uh, like on the Eames house, the wood wall, we basically just cleaned that and just allowed all of the scratches and discolorations to stay there. It's just part of the house. And, and we basically sort of followed this approach pretty much on every, uh, uh, on, 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 on every project. I mean, it's really sort of, it's a uh, philosophical, uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, approach, yeah, yeah. But, you know, we've had projects that we have done that have then led to other projects. That's kind of how it has uh, uh, been for us. That's a really lovely approach. Thank um, you. Well, um, I, I, Frank and Ravi, it's been such a treat. Uh, if there's anything else you'd like to just throw out there before we wrap up. Well, you know, again, I mean, we just want to thank uh, both, both of, of you, you. Uh, for including us. And, you know, as I said earlier, uh, we have been just so captivated over the years to see Janice's work. And, and, and so for us, it's, it's you know, it's, it's, it's a real, uh, uh, honor and, and, and pleasure to be in a way connected to uh, your exhibition. And the next time we come to Ojai, and we do come to Ojai uh, uh, every now and then, I mean, we'll, we will certainly sort of uh, peek in through that window and, and, and look in. And, and, and we, guys. we initially <laughs> thought that uh, <laughs> that, uh, that we, we were going to be talking about Jana's work. So, um, uh, but uh, her work is is so inspiring, and um, and I, I, I hope that you know one day we'll, we'll have enough of, of a body of work that someone like like she will document and and uh, well she started <laughs> and uh, and not not only document but but see the beauty in, and 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 that's what's what's really inspiring yeah. is what, what she sees through her eyes. Mm -hmm. That, that's a wonderful way to wrap it up. I just want to thank you all again and um, sharing with our audience that um, Jana Ireland's uh, exhibition, Looking In, Looking Out, is currently on view. Um, the exterior are images, photographs that she took of one of two Paul R Williams homes in Ojai. Um, that was built in the 20s, sort of Spanish style. So it's been, um, you know, exciting to see her share her, um, her selects from that experience um, that we were able to get her into the, um, into the residence. And um, these are for the first time in color. She was very intentional with the, the, the monograph and the previous work being in black and white. So um, I think that's, a, that's worth the trip alone to, <laughs> to visit, right, Jana? And, um, and, <laughs> and then the, um, as you peek on the interior or make an appointment with me, um, uh, uh, you'll get to experience some of the photographs that she's made over the last year um, as part of um, you know, being at home in quarantine. Um, and they offer, I think, um, quite a poignant and again, poetic, um, you know, punctuation to, that's a, a shared experience in many ways, but through a, um, a very uh, talented artist's uh, eye. So um, thank you, Jana, for sharing that with us. Um, again, big thanks, Frank, Ravi, it's been a treat and, um, and look forward to, um, to seeing you in Ojai. And thank you everybody. Oh, please visit our website. I dropped it into the chat. We do have two more talks coming up with John as part of her show. So please stay tuned. Okay, thank you everyone. Okay, thank you. Thank you everyone, bye-bye. Thank you everyone, bye-bye.